person, a property, a table, a book, a chair, a dog, a cat, then you are doing a, a deliberate act to reduce the person to nothing. You know that that is not true. It is like the kind of things they say. If you look at the history of a lot of Southern historians after the, you know, uh, after the, the, after the Civil War and so on, what you're going to read, you're going to read books where, they, where, where a whole corpus of historians saying that Africans are lazy, a, a, a theme that is, was, was pushed by Hollywood about the laziness of Africa, they know that is not true. Uh -huh. If that is true, I think Europeans were the, were the biggest idiots on the earth. To go to Africa hundreds of years to bring back lazy people does not make sense. <laughs> it doesn't. Uh -huh. So they know that. Uh -huh. But they had to reduce the African to that quality. Because of the projection that um, African history is mainly a history dealing with slavery. What can you tell us about slavery within the... Um, within the European world, that is, Europeans enslaving other Europeans. Yes, it happened in France, it happened in Germany, it happened in England. The very first people that the English enslaved were their own people. They were sending them to Virginia, they were sending them to the Carolinas, they were sending them to the Caribbean, to Barbados, to Montserrat, eventually sending them to Australia. These were, had been convicts, not only convicts, but people who had been press gang, they would go across the streets of London or any of the big cities and pull anybody off the streets and take them, bring them to a seaport, push them on a wait ship. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, just take somebody off the street? Yes, press gang, they called it. Uh -huh. and, they would, and they would make you serve in the Navy or they would send you to Virginia because they wanted people to build and develop Virginia, you know, when America was a colony. Uh -huh. Lots of the prisons of England Newgate and all the great prisons that they're talking about in England were bursting to capacity with people who had committed crimes. And, Q, and I want to put in here, there were no black faces in those jails at the time. It was crowded with, Euro with white people, Europeans, Britishers, who had committed one crime. In fact, during that period, highway robbery was at the highest in England. Covent Garden, the famous Covent Garden street where they have operas and all the big theaters and so on today. Do you know at 12 o'clock in the day, during the middle years of the 18th century, when England was supposed to be an enlightened place, there was at least one murder in that street every day. Good evening and welcome to For the People. If I told you that according to a Scottish anthropologist and historian, David McRitchie, that quote, so late as the 10th century, three of the provinces of Scotland were wholly black, and the supreme ruler of the provinces became for a time paramount king of transmarine Scotland, end quote, you might shake your head in disbelief. And if you are a European American whose last name is Moore or Douglas or a host of other names which may indicate African ancestry, you might find this series particularly interesting. Our guest, Professor Edward Scobie, has studied the history of Africans in Europe. Professor Scobie is Associate Professor of History in the Black Studies Department of New York City College. Author of Black Britannia, A History of Blacks in Britain, Professor Scobie has been a visiting professor at Princeton, a broadcaster for the BBC, and was twice mayor of Rousseau, the capital of Dominica, West Indies. <laughs> 
just heard was composed by the Chevalier Saint-Georges. It was music of the latter part of the 18th century. Saint-Georges was an African, the son of the Marquis of Langley and an African woman slave born on the island of Guadeloupe. From Guadeloupe, his father took him to France, to Paris. And it is there in Paris that he grew up, and he became one of the most famous composers of the time. He was a contemporary of Mozart, a con con contemporary of Haydn, a contemporary of all the composers of that period, pe people like the son of the last son of Johann Christian Bach. And he was not only a composer, but he was also a, viol a violinist of note. He was also a swordsman, uh, a tremendous champion swimmer, an equestrian. He was a man, he was a Renaissance man, you could say, mm -hmm. in Paris at that period. But Saint-Georges was not the only African composer at that period. There were many composers, Africans, composing what we tend to call classical music at that time that was comparable to the best music that the Mozarts and the, and the others played. Are they still playing his music today? They are still playing his music today uh -huh. on, on, on um, concerts in Europe and concerts over here. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. While the greater part of the history of African people took place on the continent of Africa, what can you tell us in a general way about the African presence in early Europe? Well, the African presence in early Europe can go back, way back to Grimaldi Man, so about 40,000 years ago. And if we adhere to the scientific... 40,000, you said? 40,000 years uh -huh. ago. If we adhere to the scientific conclusion of Sheikh Antediop, that um, man was born in one place at one time, the monogenetic theory um, that was backed by scientific evidence, we, the Grimaldi man, when he moved to Europe, he moved to Europe during the period of the last glaciation and stayed there. And over a period of 20,000 years, conditions changed, he changed, and so eventually the African, the Grimaldi man, became white. And the origins of the white race stem out of the Grimaldi man. And that went on for a long period of time. But towards the, the time of, of the Roman period in in England, where it was said at one time that there were Africans in Britain well before the, the British, the English as such, came there. There were um, Africans there during the third century AD. There were Africans there um, in, in, in um, the Roman army, and there were Africans there afterwards, long afterwards. So all throughout that period, we know that there were Africans in Scotland, in Ireland, in England, and there was a, there was a race of Africans called the Ciliars, or the Sons of the Blacks, they call them, with their, in what, what the historians call Transmarine Scotland. And they lived there in the 10th century, and they had an African king. And from that period of time, we Africans were predominantly all over, all over Britain. What happens, and if we listen to, Go ahead. to David McRitchie, who was an archaeologist in the, in, the latter, in the past century, in the 19th century, we will remember that he said that to call the British or the English whites is in fact unpure is not actually correct because we, um, the English are a people who have been mixed and have had African, um, after the blood of Africa running through them. So this is a known, this is a known fact. Not only McRitchie, others, Dr. Kenneth Little, who is a, a famous anthropologist in, um, in England and Scotland, he maintains the same thing and he backs it with scientific ed evidence. There has been skeletal remains in, um, in England to show that, um, oh, oh, in 1951, they found um, a, a, a cemetery with about 250 um, ske skeletal remains dating back to 230, 230, 235, 238 AD. And they, they, they were found to be the, the, the remains of Africans who had been there. So constantly. You had been there, not as slaves. Not as slaves. Right? No, no, no. Uh -huh. Remember that these Africans were not there as slaves. They were, in fact, as conquerors, as soldiers, and many of them later on, towards the beginning of what you call the Tudor period and the Elizabethan period, they then began to come there as soldiers, as artisans, musicians, as even later on, as even they came there as, uh, they were there as scholars. Mm 
-hmm. And it is it's repeated throughout the history of that of, of Europe at that time that there were African scholars mm -hmm. very much in evidence. And remember that at a time when slavery was at its height, they had these men there. So Africans did not go there in a menial capacity. They went there as um, not conquerors to, de to devastate the land, but they, their presence and their prestige offered mm -hmm. something to the culture and the civilization of Europe. This is something that has been swept under the historical carpet and mm -hmm. something that we need to underst understand. Y you have written on the image of African women in, in early Europe. Um, what can you tell us about the image of the African woman in Europe, specifically looking at Greece? We can look at the African woman as the, an African goddess, an African queen, an African Venus, and they, they were not only looked upon as, in, in a physical way, of, of, um, as seductors, seductresses. Mm -hmm. They were looked upon in that capacity because when you look at the, the goddesses of Greece, all the goddesses and the gods too of Greece had their origins and, from Africa from the beginning, from Zeus himself, and Zeus and his son. Then there are the, the, the goddesses like Artemis, who is the goddess of wisdom. There was um, Minerva, who was also uh, one of the great goddesses. There was Diana. There was, and all of them stem from the, the goddess figure of, of Isis, and mm -hmm. again, who was a, a, a goddess from Kemet and from, from Africa. So that, that was there already um, Africans looked to African women looked upon in that fashion and they were looked upon again in a kind of spiritual fashion because many of the the people who could perform who were, who were looked upon as people who could perform miracles and saints were, were, were African women who were deified even in in, in, um, in Portugal people like Fatima Fatima comes from Fatima was a Moorish woman who was married to a nobleman and she died in a tragic and when you go to the shrine of Fatima, that is who you go to. That is who you go to pay reverence to. You go to pay reverence to an African woman who has been deified. Now you say that almost all of the Greek goddesses were actually um, African, had an African antecedent or African model, or what have you. Um, why is it that African American students, white students in America, and pretty much across the, the world? can read all of this Greek literature and not know this? Again, it's because of something that many of our scholars talk about, our African scholars. We know it's gone on for a long period of time. The falsification of history. This has been the main cause. The changing over, the in, in, in point, in making of Greece the origins of Western civilization when we know that has not been the case. And it is because of that that everything seems to start, as we remember in the early stage, Greece was not the conquering country in Africa before. It was long after that, during the time of Alexander. Later on, they became conquerors. But before that, they were, they were there. They accepting from the teachers in Kemet. They learned from the, te the, from the teachers. Pythagoras, you just named them, the whole line. We know that from when we read Stolen Legacy by George James, Professor George James. So these things have been hidden. But even Herodotus, Herodotus tells us about the origins of the African people in Kemet, not only come oh, from the, uh, of, of Egypt, going mm -hmm. all the, I say Kemet, but uh, use it. I understand. Origin, uh -huh. But Egypt. Uh, it is replete in all the histories that we deal with, up to the, the, the later scholars who have been writing about it. But remember, the Egyptologists at one time, the, the sort of club of the Egyptologists, mm -hmm. they were people who were basing everything from Greece, and so in fact, completely ignoring uh, mm -hmm. Ethiopia and Egypt. So let, let, me, let me read a, 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 a part of a paragraph of your book. Zeus, yeah. Zeus, yeah. known as the father of all the gods, was of Ethiopian ancestry. Yeah. He sired a son named Epaphus. The great Achilles, tragic Greek poet, said of Zeus, and thou shalt bring forth black Epaphus, thus named from the manner of Zeus engendering. We would t t expound on that a little bit, please, if that's possible. What is possible to say is that um, 
the whole the God concept and the goddess concept, something that the most mythology, Roman mythology and Greek mythology is based on the works of divine people, spirit, uh, men of, who were giants, gods and goddesses. To, so to base your literature, to base your culture on gods and goddesses makes you some, something sublime, so it makes you something like the creator. It was to keep Africa out of it totally means that you, um, Africa can lay no claim in the histories of the world to having that divine um, God force behind in its, in its people. That's on a spiritual value, which is essentially an African value, the spiritual value that comes way back from our belief in Mahat and going all the way through this, the, the teachings of all the, the, the teachers, the, the African teachers, not only in, the, in Egypt and in, in Ethiopia, but also in the Sudan, and the teachings of Africans, and also the teachings of, of, of Africans in the two most civilized, the two first civilized and cultured country in Europe, which were Portugal and Spain. Why that is so, we know it is through the Moors, the, the Moors having gone there, conquered there, and brought Spain and Portugal to the position in which they held. Well, would you tell us who the Moors were and what their contribution was all about? Well, I can only use the words of Dr. Chancellor Williams, and he puts it straight that the Moors were Africans. Lots of them were very black in color. Some were tawny more, some, but they were mixed. There was a lot of miscegenation taking place, and the Moors were an African people. Mm -hmm. The original Moors that went to Spain and to Portugal with Tarek in 1711. The Tarek, T A R I K? I, yeah. Uh -huh. The original ones were, were Berbers. Mm -hmm. And when you read even Stanley Lane Poole and the other books about the Moors in Spain, they tell you they fought pitch battles. The, the soldiers that fought pitch battles were pitch black, and they fought, they fought all the time. These were the ferocious warriors at the time. This is about 711 AD. 711 AD we're talking uh -huh. about. Mm -hmm. And there is no to it. Later, a, 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 more, a lighter tawny Moor began or came in in this, and they began to come in. Through the miscegenation that took part in North Africa, from Egypt all the way through going, and, the, and listen, the, the, by the Arabs. Originally, um, the continent which we call Arabia was an African continent. The people there were African peoples. Again, through the Mediterranean peoples, the other Mediterranean peoples, there was a lot of miscegenation. And the Moors did not conquer great parts of Africa easily. They had a hard, hard time. In point of fact, there was a time that they, the, not the Moors I'm talking about, the Arabs, mm -hmm. they had a, lot, lo, a hard job to turn um, lots of Africa into the faith of Islam. It wasn't an easy fight. It wasn't a 49-day war. It wasn't anything of the sort. It was a long, protracted war. In fact, they, they never thought that they would succeed. Eventually, they did. So when we are talking about the Arabs, we're not talking about a race. We're talking about a religion. We're talking about Islam. We're talking, that's what we're talking about originally, the ones that went into Spain. Later on, when other, continue, uh, other Moors came in, for instance, in 1086, you had the Almor Almoravid. Okay, and who were they? They came in. They again were an African people of Berber stock that uh -huh. came in. When they were de defeated, they were de by the Almohads. When they were defeated, these were also a African people, a black people that conquered. So for that whole period of time, you had Africans and mixed, you had mixed Arab, you, in point of fact, Arab Africans, African Afro-Arabs, as some people, many scholars call them that, who were there. So all the creating of, of the great cities, the great buildings, Cordova, Seville, Toledo, you name them, all of these came out of the science, the technology, the culture of the Moors. We know that for a fact, and up until 1492, the same thing happened in Portugal. Portugal, even, even before, and the important thing about Portugal is this, with the Moors, is not so much that they brought, um, they, 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 they made Cordova one of the most fascinating cities in the world with lights all over the place, and with paved streets, and with bars, and with um, 
coolers for the hot weather and that is not only that what the Moors, particularly those in Portugal did they were responsible for Portugal's global expansion a lot of praise is given to Prince Henry the navigator what they don't tell you this ex ascetic son the scholarly son of John the second and Prince and Princess and um, Queen Philippa what they don't tell you is that he was taught by the Moors Ibn Battuta and others taught him he learned all his navigation from the school of the Moors there at the time cartography um, everything he learned the compassing everything he learned it and it was through him that you had your people like Vasco da Gama Magellan the Cabots and, um, mm. and and later the the Christopher Columbus mm -hmm. going across the world and conquering places but for this navigation and but for this knowledge of the Moors Portugal would never have achieved this kind of global mm -hmm. control of the world as it did Portugal actually before Spain actually it would not have done that as you know at the time Portugal and Spain later on became divided into two by the Pope and um, but that would not have happened but for the Moors credit is not given to the Moors in fact Stanley Lane Poole in, in, in the last sentence in his book the story, entitled the story of the Moors uh -huh. in Spain he says um, what the Spanish what the Spanish did not believe did not understand mm -hmm. is that they had killed the goose that laid their golden egg that's how he ends his book this is the last sentence which in means the book, which means in driving out the moors and mm -hmm. they drove out the sephardic jews at the same time who went to hamburg and went to Ant to amsterdam and other places that in doing that they had killed portugal uh, portugal and spain began to go down and down and down for a while he says the light shone the light of the Renaissance shone briefly, but then darkness came over the land, and Spain and Portugal reverted to um, religious wars, inquisitions, horrors, and it, its books were destroyed, its libraries were destroyed in the same way that Alexander had done. They destroyed thousands and thousands of books, libraries, education. All of that was destroyed at that time. Many of the Moors that stayed there, another thing that is not very well spoken of is that a lot of them changed their names and became took on Spanish names and they became Catholics and they remained in Spain mm -hmm. so lots of families in Spain from that period and Portugal who pre profess to be to be Spanish they are actually this have Moorish antecedents in the in, in them they are or they originate from the Moors. A lot of that is not is not really you known. And and also the Sephardic Jews, a lot of them that were there, who were the men of commerce and men of bankers and so on and money, a lot of them changed their faith, became Catholic, and took part in this um, conquering or this um, taking over of the New World. In the same way Columbus set them in motion, they were part and parcel of the whole thing that took place then. Okay, let me, let me, yes. before you go any further, let me ask you this. There's somebody sitting home watching TV, uh, cooking some beans and rice, or a mechanic fixing a car at the shop, um, looking at this, somebody working at McDonald's, uh, um, an African uh, teenager, an African student, um, listening to all of this, will say, well, what does this have to do with how I get food, um, how I'm going to buy this nice car, um, um, how I'm going to um, um, uh, gain a livelihood? What has this got to do with it? Why is, why is this history um, important for me to, to know and understand and appreciate? All right, let me put it this way to you. Mm -hmm. There are two places that Africans can get miseducated with the kind of education that has obliterated them, have washed them out of history, and they can also get miseducated in the streets. That is another, another school of miseducation, the streets. All right, Europe and European children have always known who they are. Their 
Notre Dame, their Eiffel Towers, their Westminster Abbey, their kings, their queens. They've been having that for hundreds and hundreds of years. They know who they are. That is why eventually they can band together and get together on a national way and in an international way because they know what, uh, what is important to them. Mm -hmm. Chancellor Williams again wrote, he, this, he gives this story, and it's a very short story. He says, some years ago, there was an African elder sitting around walking through one of the rural areas, and there was an anthropon archaeologist and, uh, from Europe, um, from England, asked, coming there looking for the Sumer people, mm -hmm. and asked him about where are the Sumer people? What happened to them? And this African elder explained, my people, the Sumer people, they lost their history, so they died. Mm -hmm. Our children and ourselves have been living a living death, not knowing who we are, and we don't care who we are. You can only get on at terms dictated to you by the people in power. You can't go further than there if they say you can't go further than there. No matter who you are, we cannot dictate our own terms. We cannot control our own lives. What is more, we cannot control our own mind because we do not know who we are. To get a car perhaps can be an easy thing but you can go to prison, it's just as easy to go to prison as to get a car in this society. When you know who you are, you become a person. A person without a history is a non-person. Can you feel the tension is rising? We hear voices that fire in the night. Astronauts to entrepreneurs, the contribution.